This time on the Cameron Journal Podcast, we're talking with writer and publisher Jessica Moon. We're talking about her process and her journey from becoming a writer um, and getting a traditionally published book deal to deciding to open her own house and publish her own books as well as the amazing books of other people. It's a great peek behind the curtain into how the publishing industry works and what we both kind of find right and wrong with publishing as it is today. It's a fascinating conversation and a must listen to for all writers. So strap in, it's the Cameron Journal Podcast. Let's go. This is the Cameron Journal Podcast. It's a place where we talk about important things. It's a place where we bring a little slice of the news to you. And it's a place where we do important things, have important conversations. It's also things that I like to talk about. My name is Cameron Cowan, and this is the Cameron Journal Podcast. Today on the Cameron Journal Podcast, we are joined by Jessica Moon. She is part, she's the co-founder and creative director of Shadow Spark Publishing. She also does book covers and this sort of thing. And we're going to nerd out on books, writing, book covers, all this sort of thing. So welcome, Jessica, to the Cameron Journal Podcast. Thank you for having me. Excellent. You're very welcome. We are, we've had lots of writers on or we will have by the time people hear this. And so I thought it would be fun to kind of see the other side of the business um, and talk a little bit about publishing. So why don't you tell us about your background and how you got into the book cover book publishing business? Sure. Um, Well, I actually am a writer as well. Um, uh, My co-founder and I, Mandy Russell, um, were working on a series of books um, and they'll actually start coming out very soon. Um, but we had gone through like the traditional querying process, um, and had actually gotten all the way to contract with like a, what people consider like a traditional publisher. Um, and just were, um, were less than enthused with, (laughs) with, (laughs) you know, with the, the deal we were given, which, you know, makes sense. We're untested authors, blah, blah, blah. But I just... And so we we actually rejected uh, that offer and kind of went back to the drawing board and was like, well, what are we going to do? Um, At that time, neither of us knew much about self-publishing and I was kind of wary of it um, because we didn't know much. And I think it's also come it's come far in the last couple of years as well, as far as like the quality and then the perception of what it is to be a self-published author. You know, there used to be like this stigma against it and um and I wasn't really down for that. And so to Mandy's credit, she listened to podcasts. She did all of this research and she came to me with this idea of, well, why don't we just start our own house? And I was like, can you, can you do that? <laughs> Is that a thing? <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's totally a thing. <laughs> so, um, you know, we registered, we're in Texas. Um, so we registered with the state of Texas and all of that. And suddenly, you know, I'm uh, the CEO of a corporation, which is hilarious. Um, you know, so we started out with the intention of publishing our books. Um, that's why the house was founded. And but it, we realized that what we needed to do first was to kind of build a platform, um, you know, get some authors, see if there's even any interest out there from people who, you know, want to come and have these two chicks from Texas publish their books. Um, you know, she has a background in marketing. I've long done graphic design and all of that. And um, my husband, Chad, and I are actually, we, we work on the covers together. Um, and it just, it works out really well. And so we put out for queries and we got some interest and, uh, you know, we got four authors ended up, uh, releasing one, um, and started moving forward. And then last year, you know, when the world ended, uh, yep. <laughs> we like, yeah, um, we took stock of where we were and where we wanted the house to be before our books, you know, came onto the market. And we had some, some unforeseen free time to, <laughs> and As decided, to open, <laughs> yeah, right. And so we opened up to queries again. And this time, 
there was just a flood of interest. Um, and I think we were both, I know I was, uh, almost taken aback by, you know, the, the number of people and the quality of the manuscripts that were coming our way. And so now we are up to 11 authors, um, not including us. And, uh, yeah, man, we published, I should, I should know these numbers off the top of my head. I don't know. I'm terrible at this. We published like a good dozen books last year. We have like 28 on the schedule for this year so far. And, that includes our nine and then there's, you know, so some of our authors have finished their original trilogy. So they're starting their next round of books and it's kind of just almost organically grown into this thing that both Mandy and I are kind of in awe of. Um, yeah. We're actually like starting to make some waves, which again, we started this to have a quasi legitimate path to publishing our own books and it's just turned into this thing um that neither of us expected but both of us you know absolutely love it so no that's that's a journey that's yeah that's a um, amazing amazing sort of journey i i had a similar problem slash situation with self-publishing my first book was a non-fiction collection of essays that I had written on my old show, The Cameron Cowan Show, plus some new material that I had added in. And nonfiction is the type of market that if you don't have 100,000 followers on Twitter, no one wants to publish you. Right. That's, right. You know, that's kind of the reality of the whole thing. And so I was kind of like, well, hmm. And, <laughs> you know, what are we going to, you know, I, I want to do this. I, I need to kind of get something out. What am I going to do about this? I was very fortunate. I was less dubious about self-publishing because I already had other friends who had moved in that direction when mm -hmm. it was much more difficult to do. It's gotten, a, you are absolutely right. It's gotten way easier right, um, right. in the, in the near term. And so, yeah. And then, Similar. I didn't get as far in the query process as you did. I had two agencies ask for full manuscripts of my first novel, and then they both passed. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was just kind of like, well, screw it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I know that I, all too well. <laughs> I, I had already, I had already done one book by that time, and I'm like, I'll have this done in a couple weeks, and we'll have it out there, and that's fine. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, so it, and so then I kind of did that, and then I had my short story collection. I got a literary publishing out of that collection, and that, but then it didn't matter because I released it the day the pandemic started. So, oh gosh, <laughs> yeah, Mar Mar March thirteenth was the day my short story collection. Oh came no, out. Yeah. <laughs> Your timing uh, is impeccable. <laughs> yeah, what, with a lot, of, I mean, a lot of books come out in March. There were, right. I, remember, I remember that first week of the pandemic, there were tons of people that were like worst book launch ever on worst week ever. Oh like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was, we just, had I, one of those too. Tom's like, yeah, it was, it was a disaster. Yeah. So that, so, and it was, it, for me, it kind of sucked because my literary publishing came out the same month I launched the collection and it was like perfectly synergistic and it would have worked so well, except for COVID. Like, right. And then things just kind of got crazier from, from there. So, and it, and it also didn't help. I went through a breakup like two weeks beforehand. So I was already in a weird and, place even before the world got crazy. So, yeah. Wow. So great mental space all the way around. Yeah. It was just a super positive time. Um, so yeah, so it, I, I totally get the, you know, get all of, all of you know, kind of the dynamics that you, that you went through. So let's, let's dive in to I, what is probably the, the biggest challenge you faced starting your own house, taking on other people and jumping from writer to publisher. What do you think has been the hardest thing? Um, balancing all the different hats that I have to wear or all the plates, spinning the plates, whatever metaphor you want to use. Yeah. Um, you know, it's because I still have a day job. Like I still work full time. We have the publishing house. We're writing nine books. I have a family, you know, and all of this, um, it took, it took some time to kind of, 
And it's something I have to constantly be on top of, um, making sure that none of my various responsibilities um, get neglected, you know, because despite all of my aspirations and all my other stuff that I have to do, you know, it is of the utmost importance that my husband and my son have me as well, you know, at least at least a decent amount of time during the week. So, um, yeah, that's probably the most, uh, you know, we've had like our, one of our authors, Dan Fitzgerald, he, um, he ended up taking over our social media for us. Um, and so we, you know, he became our social media curator, which took one responsibility off of my plate. Cause that was something I was doing. Um, our, one of my long-term friends, Salem Floyd came on and she is acting as head editor for round one of all of our manuscripts. So, um, you know, once it became pretty clear that this really has potential to be a long-term, like, positive thing, um, we started having to do something that I'm not the best at, and that is ask for help. You know, and luckily we had people, um, like I said, Dan and, and Salem, like volunteer to take on part of it, um, freeing us up to write our books and do the book covers and format the manuscripts and and all of the other various things that we have to do. So, no, absolutely, yeah, I can definitely see how that would be a an odd an odd dynamic and kind of, I mean, relatively speaking to when you started, all of this is happening in a fairly short period of time. Oh yeah, no, my life now to my life two years ago is completely different. Yeah, I mean that's <laughs> that's a bit you know a little bit a little bit frightening. Um, yeah, it, it is. I don't think I was I was having a dialogue on Twitter yesterday, and I would get, I'd be interested to get your perspective. And someone had posted, "Does anyone actually enjoy writing?" And I said, "No, not really." And most of the greats didn't either, so don't feel bad if you don't. <laughs> and <clears throat> You know, another, you know, one of my followers was like, I humbly ask you to go look to do something more fulfilling. And someone else was kind of like, well, yeah, but considering it's, you know, art and it's what we do and we're driven to do it no matter what. And I said, my complaints with writing have very little to, I mean, there's lots of things, problems with the process in terms of it takes too long. It's way too time consuming. You need blocks of time to really be creative and other forms of art are not that way, you know, mm-hmm. sort of thing. It's writing is unique in that it's so horrifically time consuming. But my chief complaint with this industry is it's economic complaints. This industry is broken right. and no one's interested in fixing it. Like, it doesn't work very well and everybody seems to be pretty happy with it not working very well. Um, and so when it comes to, you know, the joy of writing or the joy of publishing or the economics of it all, having lived on both sides of the fence, what do you think about all that? Well, I mean, I think the industry is broken, Um, and you know, those at the top are happy to keep it that way because they're at the top. So why would they want to change it? Yeah. They benefit from the system. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. Um, but I do think that there is a growing undercurrent, um, of whether it's independent houses like shadow spark or self-publishing or, you know, the advent of social media and all of that for all of its follies has really allowed creative people to come together in different ways and kind of, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to curse, um, say, uh, you know, oh, yeah. the industry. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, <laughs> I, had, I had a guy on the 25th of January that literally every other word was an F bomb. Go right uh, ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I'm not, I don't know. Um, so, you know, basically saying, fuck the way things have always been done. We're going to find a better way to do it and do it our way. Um, and maybe it won't have the international acclaim and New York Times bestseller, whatever, but we can still find our niche. We can still have our voices heard and Shadow Spark can help other, you know, like minded people bring their work to the world. And yeah, maybe it's a smaller flame, but all flames start small. And who knows? I think the potential for growth is astronomical. It, it, we're just going to have to kind of wait and see if a, a you know, a substantial percentage of people are also like, you know what, fuck this. Yeah, no, I'm going to go this way. 
So, you know, I, I think when it comes to writing, um, it is a very, um, I mean, yeah, it's time intensive, but for me, I get so wrapped up in living what I'm writing that, you know, it's, it's a very stressful yet cathartic thing for me. Um, you know, now my, my authors, you know, they react in various ways. Some, you know, run around in circles and stress out others, crank out books like nobody's business. Everybody's different, you know? And um, I've definitely seen like a whole, you know, the wide spectrum <laughs> of different authors, um, you know, signed to Shadow Spark. So you just kind of have to learn how to work with each person's quirks and help coax their best work out of them without, you know, driving them to some kind of mental breakdown or something. Because I think we're all writers are odd ducks, dude. Like we're all freaking weird. And when you find other weirdos that are your kind of weird and you're able to come together, it, you can create something really beautiful. So, yeah, the industry is broken, but I think, you know, it's on the, pro, you know, the precipice of great change, potentially. Yeah, I mean, I, my, my chief problem with the publishing industry is is economic and it's partly to do because markets and things have changed. I mean, people would people today would be shocked to find out there were writers decades ago, their whole careers that this is all they did is they wrote short stories a few times a year for a handful of publications and just lived off of that. Like there mm -hmm. were people who that's all they did. And the quality, because of that, obviously was very high, and all this sort of thing. Like that was their whole life, and 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 for a lot of writers who were not necessarily inclined to write a book or whose books were not very successful, mm -hmm. um, that was a fine sort of middle class way to be a writer. And now I feel like all we're doing is chasing crumbs from Amazon, and the ability to actually make a living from one's art in 2021 is basically impossible. Well, and I don't I know find if I agree with disturbing. I think I think if you're looking for a quick fix for your life, then yeah. yeah. You know, for I'm looking more long term. You know, I'm more interested in building like a catalog and you know it's all the research that we've done shows that you know and it, but it takes time and that's the thing um if you have 10 20 x number of books behind you then you will over time and yeah maybe it is crumbs but crumbs add up you know um, yeah. And Amazon's not the only avenue. You know, we do publish through Amazon, but there are other avenues like Ingram Spark and other, you know, things that, um, and honestly, I don't do that side of it. That's Mandy. So I, yeah. I, I don't have a whole lot of information on that stuff. But um, no, I, I do Ingram Spark. I don't, I didn't want to be Amazon exclusive. I, mm -hmm. that's, that's a bad deal. Like, that's just as a business. Oh, yeah. No, person. we're not Amazon exclusive, but yeah. that is one of our avenues. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. It's like my books are on Amazon, but there's a lot of people. There's a lot of indie authors who go the Amazon exclusive route and they, and I've taken some of the classes and read some of the stuff and they are literally chasing crumbs of Amazon trying sure. to do all the things to get on Kindle unlimited or this or that or whatever have you. And, and for me as someone who I've spent my entire life working in the fine arts in, in one way or another, I've either worked in fashion or run magazines. I was a musician when I first got started, my whole life has been in the arts. It is depressing that good quality writers are reduced to chasing after the crumbs off Jeff Bezos' table. That's no. just, it's like a terms of like the state of the arts. I think that's kind of sad. Sure. Sure. But again, I think that, you know, and yeah, that is, that is a big Avenue right now, but, and I don't think you're alone in feeling the way you do, you know, and but it's going to take enough of us getting pissed off enough to actually do something about it, which is the difficult part because writers are like herding cats. 
Yeah, you know? really, like, and hurting feral cats at that. Yeah, like, full of righteous indignation and no idea how to actually go about fixing it. You know, yeah. so yeah, it's it's a it's a difficult it's a very difficult sort of sort of thing. And I I find the thing I find most funny when I still used to be on Reddit, I was on this you know. I was in this subreddit for that kind of involved traditional publishing, and there were people who worked in traditional publishing. And I wrote a long post about like why and how the industry is broken, and how it's like you query, you never get feedback. Sometimes you never mm-hmm. hear from people. It's shouting into the void. This is incredibly stupid and frustrating. The way we do this, the way we treat people, is awful. No other industry would function the way book publishing functions like we couldn't trade stocks and bonds in the same way we do writing (laughs) like nothing else in this our society would work if it operated on the rules of publishing you cannot well you probably can you can imagine all the people who work in traditional publishing what they thought of my post i had to mute it and not reply because and yet, I, it was like burn the witch, burn the witch. Right. Well, and a lot of everything you said were were things that we all felt uh, that yeah. Mandy and I felt. You know, which is one reason why we turned away from traditional publishing. I can't tell you how many agents or you know we ended up having to wait for um, various publishers to have unsolicited manuscript openings because, like, it just it wasn't. <sighs> And no feedback, no feedback from anybody. You know, we would query agents and never hear back, like, ever, Um, good or bad. And the few that did, you know, would ask for fulls, and then they're like, this is amazing. I don't know how to market this, so no. But, you know, that that was it. Um, And so, you know, like, when we opened the queries, I always, uh, well, we trade off and on, but we always try to, even if it is a no, Um, you know, we try to provide constructive criticism or at least give reasonings for why, because we were writers first and we know what it's like to just be shut down with no reason given as to why. No, I, I did the same thing. I shut down my magazine at the end of 2020 because 2020 kind of killed our business model. Mm hmm. And we had gotten a good literary desk going um, and we'd publish, I published some really interesting people and we were, you know, a two man operation um, kind of like you guys. And I, I took the extra time to work with writers, including one writer. I actually sent his piece back at for rewrites. And I always marketed myself as, I try to publish literature the way literature used to be published. Writers working with editors making things great. Like, we would not have Emily Dickinson without good, a good editor. Editor made her whole thing. Like, Jane Austen as well. Like, so many amazing writers would have never gotten where they were if it were not for good editing. And so I always prided myself on, like, developing actual relationships and not just making it some sort of weird content mill. Sure, sure. Um, and and I, I just I, I don't for 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 some reason and it's it's got to be the the modern business model that whole idea of developing writers over time seems to have gone out the window. Like See, yeah, but that is actually a big focus of ours. We do two rounds of edits yeah. um, per manuscript. Um, you know, one that um, Salem goes through, and then one that either Mandy or I will go through. And, you know, all of our authors have to be open to critique, you know, because we'll go through and pick it apart and put, you know, both positive and negative, you know, things. But the whole point is to help them grow as a writer and produce the best content possible. Otherwise, you know, because we're not about to put something out with our name on it that we're not terrifically proud of. (laughs) Of course not. So, you know, but no, I I know, I know what you mean, Um, which is, again, something that we've tried to really foster Um, and you get to know them as people as well as just writers throughout the process. And so, you know, the people that we published in 2020, um, 
you know, we've actually become a lot closer to because you get to know the workings of their mind through their art. Um, and, you know, so I'm looking forward to getting to know some of our other authors a little better this year through, you know, the publication of their works. So, um, so yeah, no, it's definitely that is a huge focus of ours. And I completely agree that it seems like for most people that very important relationship has been diminished, if not lost altogether. Yeah, and it, it's kind of, and even it's like development over time, like there was, especially in the 20th century, there were a lot of major authors, their first book was not their best work. Mm-hmm. It oftentimes was book three or four. Right. You know, so there's a lot of people like Truman Capote would not have a career in today's writing environment. Like, no. He wouldn't, <laughs> no, you know. no, no. J.D. Salinger published one book, said screw you to the whole industry, and then disappeared for the rest of his life. He would not have a career in today's writing industry. You know, all of these people that wrote these amazing things, they just, the today's industry would not, would just not completely ignore them. And I wonder how many Harper Lee's, Truman Capote's, J.D. Mm-hmm. Salinger's mm-hmm. we are missing. Because the industry's broke. <laughs> like, right. Know, much, and we are happy to take them kidding. and publish them <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> you know, that was what I was like when we opened for queries, especially the second round, we were, we were amazed by the quality of some of this. And we're like, are you sure though? <laughs> yeah. But like, but like you could go, <laughs> you could go to tour, you could go to, you know, all these other places. Yeah. Um, but we're not going to question too much. You know, we'll just take it and say, thank you and polish it up and, you know, present it to the world. But yeah, no, I, I think, especially if you go against the grain, um, they aren't they're interested in ticking boxes right now and not interested in hearing voices and um yeah we got sick to death of that so we said ah fuck it we'll do it ourselves and we will we pretty much do most things against the way the industry says it should be done um and you know only time will tell really if this is going to end up being what i do for the rest of my life um but as far as the last couple of years go, uh, this, the growth that the house has experienced is crazy um, because there's because the industry is broken, because there's so many voices out there with all of these amazing things that don't fit into this very, very narrow view of what specific publishers are looking for, because that's what's trendy at the moment. And they want to sell as much as they can, which, yeah, OK, sure. But that's not really what we're about. So we, obviously, we want to help, you know, our authors, um, you know, build careers or at least just get their books published. You know, there may be people who they don't want to be lifelong writers, but they've always had this story in their heart and they have this and nobody seems to want it. And You know, so if it's unique and quirky and different and intriguing, if I can't put it down, I want it, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, I it was I I totally get and under understand that uh, because I I've always when I have bought I've run three different magazines in my life, and every time that I've been looking to buy stuff, be that a feature or whatever have you, you you get that sort of rush of like, oh, this is so good mm-hmm. and so interesting. And, you know, and it's just like, mine, 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 mine. I want it, want it, want it. Like, it's you know, yep. like in the candy store sort of thing. It's it's weird. It's very, very strange. But let's talk about book covers rather than me complaining. That's probably a good <laughs> okay. shift, of, shift of focus. Um, what makes a good book cover? <clears throat> Um, it depends on the piece, you know, I, uh, there's not, you know, a specific formula for it. Um, but you want to focus of some kind for the most part, although some of our book covers like M.A. Phillips River Magic, it was more, um, an impression of things, you know, you want it to speak to, to as to what is inside without giving too much away. Um, you know, and that goes from everything to whatever images or graphics you end up choosing to the font, to the color, to the style, to, you know, every bit of everything you want to kind of tease and intrigue more than anything. And so, but for each project, the way in which we go about that, Chad and I is very different. You know, our, our, 
<laughs> our process is mainly the same, but the results vary wildly depending on the content, you know, between the covers. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I, we had, um, a book marketer, um, and graphic designer on a couple episodes ago. And I, I posed the same question to her. Um, and she did not give us quite an in-depth answer as you did, but it was very interesting how, even in their manufacture, book covers are deeply suggestive or sub- subjective mm-hmm. rather. Um, I I know a lot of people don't like photo covers. I did a photo cover for my first novel, and I because in the in the book, a young man kills his stepfather with a cast iron pan for molesting his sister, and so for the cover, I found actually my neighbor at the time. Um, and I found a cast iron frying pan and I got some good pictures of him holding all this sort of thing. And I kind of wanted to feel like, you know, you were about to get hit with the pan as you were picking up the book. And Mm -hmm. I I knew I'd gotten the right effect when my mom got it in the mail and she's like, why is this cast iron pan coming at me? I'm like, no, that's exactly (laughs) what I was intending to do. That's, that's the effect. That's what you're supposed to feel sort of thing. Um, and a lot of people don't like photo covers. And um, I tell people, I'm like, photo covers can work, but you have to really know what you're doing sort of thing. Like, right. you know, you have to, it's like, I have a really nice camera. I have professional photography equipment. I spent 30 minutes lighting that shot. <laughs> like, literally, him standing right. around, and I'm kind of like, okay, this, you know, sort of, th- like, it was, it was like one of those, like, it can work, but you gotta know what you're doing, and then you gotta do the Photoshop thing. And I did that, you know, to make different things pop out and all this sort of thing. So it was a lot of work, but it can work. So it's, I always, it's always interesting to, to talk to people who do covers as to what the process is of making a cover. And I like that part when you said it has to, it kind of has to show what's in the tin. You kind of have to tease what's inside and kind of mm-hmm. suck people in. And I like that. <clears throat> That's yeah, yeah. We get you know we get um, suggestions from the author as to what they might like to see, but we don't always go off of that. It's more like getting an impression of a sort of mood or something, and then you know it takes it takes. A, I don't I don't know that people understand how long it takes to make a good cover. Um, you know, it, it is a process. Um, Absolutely, but. Yeah, but Chad and I have have come to we luckily we work together in this like creative environment really well, even if things aren't going the way we thought they would or something's just not working or not sitting right. And we get irritated and like just walk away and have lunch or something and then return back to it later. Um, At the end, there's nothing quite like that rush when you see it all come together and you have this spark of inspiration and you're like, wait, what about this? And it works perfectly. And then you send it to the author for approval and they just lose their shit. (laughs) It's great. Um, So, yeah, no, I mean, as far as photo covers go, I mean, we haven't actually done one, but I, it's like you said, I think anything has the potential to work if it's done well. Um, you know, and I know that we don't, we don't, um, nothing's off limits, you know, there's nothing that we absolutely would not even consider doing as far as like a medium or whatever. It's just highly dependent upon the project and where our mutual creativity ends up going. And we don't, we, so we usually sit down with a vague idea, but more often than not, it's completely different by the end, but we know it's right. No, I'm <clears throat> similarly affected. I, when I'm working on a cover, I literally will compose like three different versions of it. I will leave illustrator mm-hmm. up on my laptop and I will sit and look at it for like three days. See if I still mm-hmm. like it. And sometimes I don't. And what we, I start over. And then other times I'm like, I'm, I make like tons of little dozen kind of small changes until one day, usually around four in the morning, I'm sitting there looking at it and then I'm like, yeah, let's print that. That works. That's a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. And so for my short story collection, unfinished coloring book, I kind of did this um, art deco multicolored sort of color with good sort of different square shapes. Cause I wanted to look like a child had not finished the page of their coloring book sort of thing. So it's like all these kind of splashes of color on a white background. And, um, and that was one I was literally adjusting like 
lines and ratios and boxes. And do I like mm-hmm. this version of Bauhaus font? Or is it that other one from that other foundry I found that I really want to <laughs> right. use? You know, right. <clears throat> and, you know, and it's also a matter of kind of like, and how much is it going to be to license that font? We should consider cost. <laughs> like, you know, sort of thing. Um, right. No, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, there's all these different, you know, con- tiny considerations. And it does take a surprising amount of of time but it was it 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 is important because it's the first thing people see and ultimately Mm -hmm. what's on the cover is going to sell your book so it's worth the time and effort to put in to make it happen well and with our authors too i've had more than one tell us you know that that in that moment is when this all really became real for them more so even than signing their contract or us adding them to our discord server, you know, or any of the various things that we do, it's seeing their name and their work with the artwork and all of this, like, no, this is actually happening, you know? So, um, even more so than to the public, we want to, we want our authors to really, you know, fall in love with it. Um, cause they put, in most cases, years of work into their manuscripts. So we want to wrap it up in the best package possible. No, absolutely. How do you, this is kind of a philosophy thing. How do you stay passionate about all of this? Um, I think that having my other responsibilities as well helps Actually, um, you know, my mundane job, my cooking for my family, um, spending, you know, Friday evenings with my mom. It's the time away um, that really makes it all the more exciting when I get back to it. Now, do I slog through some of it? Yes. Not the book covers so much, but you just, the little minutia that you, I don't, people don't understand everything that's involved. We didn't understand everything that's involved in running a publishing house until we were doing it. Um, You know, and so those little things are not, I mean, they're not fun, you know, but they're necessary and worth it in the end for the overall goal that where we want shadow spark to be. So, um, time away is so important. Um, even if it, and, and devoting time to my own art as well, you know, getting my own writing in as well, not just shouting everybody else's books, but the reason we started the house, you know, um, and our books start to come out March 9th actually. And they'll be released monthly cause we've been working on them for years and, Seven years we've been writing this this book series, and it's nine books, and this is the year. So I think realizing that it's actually all possibly actually going to (laughs) happen after all this time and all this work on the behalf of, yes, the house, but, you know, our other authors and whatnot, and the fact that it's going to be our turn. I mean, if that doesn't make you passionate, you need to get out of this business. (laughs) I mean, I guess that's what I'm kind of starting to struggle with is for me in this sort of sad, weird way, um, to some greater lesser degree, the passion has kind of gone out of my sails. Mm-hmm. And that's why I kind of asked the question is, and it's, it's especially awkward because I'm starting an MFA at Goddard next month. Um, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, thank you. Um, and it, and it's one of those things where I, you know, I'm I know I wouldn't have gotten in if I hadn't done, you know, three writing residencies. You know, one of them in Tennessee at Rockville at the, one of the biggest Southern writers groups in the South, and all this sort of thing. And you know, having landed at Thirty Fourth Parallel Magazine, like I know I would have, especially as someone who has two degrees in political science, totally unrelated field, have never been an English <laughs> major my whole life would have never gotten in if I didn't show that pe- those I had already s- achieved some excellence in publishing. Um, oh, this sort of thing. Like, having been at this for seven years, you know, mostly full-time, except for the time I took off two years to go work and do something else, 
I am tired. <laughs> like, right. I am <laughs> right. plain old, everyday, garden variety, tired. Mm-hmm. And it is really hard for me sometimes to get enthusiastic about some of this stuff when it's just like, you know, it's been so long, it's cost way more money than it has paid so far. And I, f- I feel like I have achieved at some level, but I'm still climbing up the hill. So it's always interesting to hear from other writers how they stay with it and how they keep going. I interviewed Trey Stone, who is, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's Norwegian um, and v- very Scandin- he's very Scandinavian polite. And, um, mm-hmm. and, uh, He's hilarious on Twitter. He though. is hilarious on Twitter. The, sad, <laughs> the interesting thing, not to spoil the interview, not as quite hilarious in person on the phone. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> like, he's kind of an interesting, like, he's very quiet, sedate, like, he's very, Aww. like, Midwest polite. Um, very nice guy. Very fascinating sort of sort of thing. Um, and it, kind of once you get him talking, then he starts going. It's a very fascinating interview. When it comes out in a couple of weeks, do listen to it. Um, oh yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, I, we've been <laughs> mutuals for years now. So yeah, and so I know. So cool. And I also got Quinn Kaiser Cochran on, and Dutch Simmons have, are going to be publishing in the next couple weeks. We're recording this in late January for the listeners, so by the time they hear this, all of these will have come out. Um, mm-hmm. And and it's just I'm I am amazed at how everybody keeps going and is okay with what's going on and is just like, like they really have that fire to do it. And I feel like I'm broken. Well, <laughs> I'm maybe, maybe, I don't know if you're broken. <laughs> maybe you're just a little aw. Maybe you're just a little cracked. <laughs> it's just, you know, honestly, I mean, you have so much other thing, so many other things going on. And like I said, time away, like I stopped writing for like a year you know, uh, it just, there was too much other stuff going on. And I, I am not, and I, this is like going against the supposed cardinal rule of writing. Yeah. I do not write every day. You know, <laughs> the people say like, like my author, Dan, he writes like clockwork yeah. every single day. And I just sit in awe of that because that is not how my scattered brain works. Um, you know, I am tightly regimented when it comes to scheduling because of all of my, you know, commitments, but it, I, when it comes to writing, I have to, I have no choice but to wait until it's time. And then I write 10, 20,000 words, uh, you know, over the course of 24 hours, you know, and, and like, I'm it's just, so it, glad you said that because our <laughs> brains function exactly the same way. I did not write yesterday and I do not feel bad because the night before I sat for five hours and literally wrote half of my next mystery series. It's it's gone from zero to I can have this published this year in about four days. (laughs) Exactly. Mandy and I, uh, you know, we're writing our own series. Um, We wrote 85% of a book in four days. You know, we yeah. had we had the outline done. We had pieces done here and there, but even things we had written years ago uh, needed to be reworked because we've come a long way, you know, in our craft since then. And oh, for sure. um, we got nine. It was not healthy. I don't recommend it. We got about nine and a half hours of sleep over the course of four days. Um, but we cranked it out. Uh, and, you know, we're hoping that's not the case for the book that we're starting to write actually today. Um, But it just, you have to listen to yourself and it's just like with anything else, nobody is exactly the same. You know, some of my authors are like clockwork others, you know, we put deadlines on them and they freak out. So, you know, it just, everybody responds differently. And no, I don't care how many likes or retweets a thread on Twitter says you do not have to write every day. If you force yourself and you're not that type of writer, it won't come out right. You'll get discouraged and you'll quit. Give yourself the time. And when it's right, you will know. Yeah. And I think it's, <clears throat> I think it's important. I think to, to kind of, you know, be aware of your own work just because you aren't writing today 
doesn't mean your brain isn't somewhat working on it. You can't exactly. be taking notes, observations, doing some research. There's other things that you can definitely, definitely do that will, will then, I think, lead to that moment where when you sit down in front of the blank page, there's going to be something there for you. Exactly. I think of it as percolating. Like it yes. just kind of has to sit sometimes and you have to get into it. Even if it's not at the forefront of your mind, it's there and it's working. And when it's time, that's when, you know, you can be super productive. And again, that that's not for everybody. I think Dan would be horrified if I suggested he write like that, <laughs> but, but I'm horrified by the concept of sitting down and writing 500 words in the morning and 500 words at night. That's not how my brain works. You know, so, I mean, the whole point of this is to be creative. So everybody's going to be different. Yeah. Think, you know? No. Yeah. And Tr Trey is very like that. He's very consistent. Mm -hmm. He absolutely writes, you know, every single day. And um, the one of the other guys I had on, Dutch, he installs um, cell phone towers. And Ben still manages to carve out, you know, writing every day sort of thing. It's a very kind of weird weird sort of weird sort of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, but I, I'm with you. My brain does not work that way. And I have mm -hmm. had years to try to force it to work that way. Mm -mm. No, it's like, no, no, give it up. It, yeah. It's like, I will, <laughs> I will sit there for four hours staring at a blank page and it's just kind of like, it's just like not today. It's just not going to happen today. Exactly. Um, yeah. It's just a very weird, that's one of the things I like about writing like blog posts and nonfiction. That's mm -hmm. all, that's always there for me. Like, I can sit down and be like, okay, I need a column for Friday, or I need something for Substack, or whatever have you, and there's something there. When I turn to a creative book, that's when my brain is like, no, no I don't have it. But then when I do have it, get out of my way. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's just no. gonna, I'm all, it's all going to come out. Exactly. Sort of you know, I kind of let my family know that, all right. I'm moving into a writing period again, so it was lovely seeing you. I will still cook, <laughs> yes. but my focus is elsewhere, you know, and so, which is why it looks like we were saying earlier, I think it's important to step away for a time too, you know, and reconnect with the other parts of your life. And in the end, it all balances out. Yeah. And I, I, I think that's a, that's kind of one of the difficult, I think it's one of the difficult things with, the, with you know quarantines and lockdowns and all this sort mm -hmm. of thing, which I, I'm sure you have much less of in Texas because it's Texas. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, you know it's it's kind of this odd thing because there, there's there's a lot less life to go experience right now. You right. know, right. Um, especially here in 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 the Seattle area. You know, we just went back to phase one, so we have no bars, we have no restaurants, we have nothing. I mean, we we're should be there. Yeah. It would be smart if we were there. But as you said, it's Texas it's and Texas, nothing yeah, makes sense so. here. So. Yeah. yeah, there's just a lot less of, of other life to kind of go go to and go towards and all that sort of thing. I think that makes it, makes it difficult. Have, have you found the pandemic easier to be creative in or harder. I, it has killed my productivity. <laughs> I should have written two books last year. I wrote zero books last year. Right. And other people like, Oh yeah, I like painted five paintings, wrote three books, started a photography <laughs> business. Life is Gucci. And I'm like, well, good yeah, to that. I was homeless <laughs> for six months. Finally got back into housing in September. My one business closed and nobody cared about my major publishing because of the pandemic. Oh and I gosh. didn't write any books last year. Like, like, so how's it been for you? How well, who you could been? write a book in that kind of environment? <laughs> like, like, no of course you didn't write any books last year um i don't know it's it's a it's a mixed bag because i mean we were luckily relatively um untouched thus far may that continue um you know, sure. I did I did have to find a new uh, like mundane job because the patisserie I worked at um, had to go like online only and wholesale and they had to cut my hours. Um, 
So I had to, you know, on a mundane level, I had to go find a new job. Um, but as far as creativity, it, it was actually, if it's not the book covers, um, it was it was a pretty big struggle um, for me just because there's, you know, in, in my house, there's Chad, there's my son, Alex, there's me, there's Mandy. And then Thursday through Sunday, there's Mandy's daughter um, and then two cats. So it's a three bedroom house. Like it's a nice size house. It's good, right. but, but I don't. People. It's a <laughs> lot of freaking people who, you know, want to. I also don't have because um, I used to write like at night. Everybody would be asleep, and that was my time. The job I got now starts at four a.m., so I work four a.m. to noon every day, which is good because then I'm home for the afternoon. But all of my writing time, like, oh, left, God. and I have no space to call my own <laughs> in this house. Yeah. So, you know, you've got a, a good-sized house full of rooms, but the only room that's left is, like, the living room library. And um, people just walk in and out, you know. And with me being me, <laughs> I get so into it that I'm listening to music and crying while writing and being super emotional and all of this crap. And then my husband walks through to get coffee and it kind of kills the mood. So I, I, um, I started, that's hence the four days of frantic writing, you know, all day and all night. Um, you know, it's, it's almost time for a she shed in the yard. Uh, yeah, yes, except now it's cold and rainy. Um, no, I set up shop in the garage for a while. Like, that's how I was like, you know, I will set up a desk out here. Um, I've since become just a little more um, insistent on, you know, you guys give me four hours, whatever. If you need something, get it now. Or forever right. hold your peace. Right. <laughs> Go away. You know? yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's it's yeah. a weird yeah, it's it's a weird it's a weird thing, it's a weird dynamic. I you know, kind of similarly, I live, you know, with my work. I live in four hundred square feet in downtown Seattle. Um and I I really miss I, I was one of those people who pretentiously writes in coffee shops. Um mm -hmm which my friends who have real jobs always made fun of me for, um, which is fine. It's very cliche and I'm, I'm okay. I'm Whatever. Fine, but... There's always coffee available. That's like, that's great. Yeah, like I'm, I, it's like, I am also a walking cliche, so I don't know why this is surprising <laughs> for you. Just accept um, it and love it and they can deal with it or not. Whatever. Yeah, exactly. Well, and the person <laughs> who kind of thought it was the most weird thing is I'm not friends with it anymore. So that's okay. Oh. Um, <laughs> he, he, he was an engineer and just didn't, didn't understand. Oh. Um, yeah, so it was kind of, but I, I desperately miss that. And it could be years before mm -hmm. it's, I'm, will ever be, it's either safe enough or I'm even allowed to write in a coffee shop. Right. And so it's just been like, sort of like at home, you know, in the space, whatever space it is, at home, whatever space that is, this sort of thing. And, and for me, it's just like, it's all one sort of weird, I don't know if this ever happens to you, but it starts to become one sort of like, <clears throat> amalgamated thing where it's just kind of like, oh yeah, I've got an IG Farben book to finish. I have three podcasts to edit to Maze. I record the weekly news podcast. I have three intros to do. Um, oh, and I need to catch up on my books. And I think quarterly taxes for the state of Washington are due. Like it just becomes it's like it's right, just no. one giant ball of just like everything. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a weird, weird thing. Yeah, I have to, like I said, I have to keep a really tight grip on my schedule and, and, you know, refer to my various calendars, like, almost daily, at least weekly, and go, okay, what's due when, what's coming up, what do we need to start thinking about, what do I need to, I need to create a merch line for this guy, this guy's pre-order is coming up soon, you know, I need to reach out to this other author about inspiration for book covers, I really need to work on my books too, um, I got to make that grocery list, and oh, I go to work tomorrow, so I got to get up at 3 a.m., you know, it's, it's all of these various things in this never-changing environment of my house and so if it wasn't for my calendars i still already do like i lose track of what day it is a lot um it's weird 
which wasn't really a thing before the pandemic. I mean, it's not like I was going out and partying all the time or anything like uh, that. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I, th- those days are so long gone, and I don't miss them. Um, but there was the option to go out, whether it's even just go to the park and go hiking or, you know, take my kid to the mall because he's a teenager and he must go to Hot Topic. You know, um, little things like that that they're no longer an option. I mean, you know, and Alex- see, that's, that's the part of my creative process. I'm missing. I, one, right. my, one of my short stories I wrote called the kingdom of Nordstrom. And it's this post-apocalyptic <laughs> thing where this guy, this guy is built a society inside the Nordstrom of the Tacoma <laughs> mall. And this guy named Alex kind of discovers it and has to choose if he's going to live with them or not. Um, and, I wrote it sitting at a cafe table in front of the Nordstrom Mm -hmm. in the Tacoma Mall. Like, I will, like, that's the part of, like, the creativity that I am missing. Mm -hmm. Is, like, sitting in a crowd of people and just being like, what if people tried to live in a mall? (laughs) <laughs> like and that's how like that's how I came up with that story idea sort of like what if we tr- what if you know it's tons of space like all this sort of thing like like that aspect of creativity I feel like the pandemic has killed see and I miss it yeah I mean I'm definitely a solitary writer for the most part but I get what you mean I mean for me honestly music has been uh, like my saving grace I mean I've always really been driven by music um you know I I. I mean, way back in high school, you know, I was in show choirs and all the musicals. I was in acapella and I've always really been drawn to music as a medium. Um, And then for inspiration, I can't stress enough how much inspiration for the series we get from music, um, from various bands and various songs. And you're listening to them and you're just going, oh, my God. Oh, this is so Lonnie in this situation. And I ha- okay, now I know what to do. And so I think by reaching out through, well, through Spotify, you know, and, and developing, because I, I do, I make playlists for each of the books that I'm writing. Because for me, I put music on, on repeat, the same song for a scene. It is the driving force. It is the heart of that song. And I am inspired through the words of whoever's singing or just the driving beat or the drums or the whatever it happens to be. Um, and so in that way, I'm reaching outside of myself and out of this, you know, 2,200 square foot house in Texas. And connecting with something else art on a different level and bringing it into myself and then putting it out onto the page. No, that's, that's perfect. I, I like to set the mood with music, particularly if I'm writing in a period of which modern music is available. Mm -hmm. So like when I'm working on IG Farben, which is a 1925 mystery series set in Chicago during prohibition, and my detective is a World War One PTSD addled fellow who is really good at at seemingly being involved in the underworld, never getting sucked into it, and solving really esoteric crimes. <laughs> and um, and so I'll put on like Parov Stellar because it's very 1920s, 1930s, four on right. the floor sort of jazz beats. Um, and then when I'm working on a Plains Girl, which is set in the 50s and 60s, then I can put on music from that period. I don't know what I'm going to do for my MFA project, which is set in the antebellum South in 1850. Um, but, um, (laughs) (laughs) I'm not quite sure what, what we're going to do for that, but yeah, music is also, I think it it just helps set the mood. It gets your mind in that place and it's so perfect. Definitely. 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 Well, this is the part of the show. We've gone a little bit long and I apologize for that. Um, uh, this is the part of the show where we talk about plugs and Twitter handles and all this sort of thing. So now's a great time to let us know where online we can find you, where we can visit you online, so people can stay in touch, because you're obviously fascinating. <laughs> obviously. Now, um, well, I mean, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at JHLMoon. Um, and uh, we're also, as far as the house goes, uh, Shadow Spark Publishing. Uh, the website is shadowsparkpub.com. Um, 
and Shadow Spark Pub, you know, at Shadow Spark Pub on Insta and Twitter as well. And the Albertine Axiom, our nine book series, uh, comes out. The first installment comes out on March 9th. And then uh, each subsequent installment will come out on the 9th of the month after that, all the way through November 9th of this year. Perfect. Excellent. And we'll, we'll leave some links for people in the show description in case they want to visit you online. So thank you so much, Jessica, for stopping by the Cameron Journal podcast and just like listening to me and ranting along with me and like inspiring me to, you know, do better and be better. I appreciate it. No, absolutely. Thank you so much. This was delightful in many unexpected ways. That's all for this episode of the Cameron Journal Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Visit us online at CameronJournal.com. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I love to talk to my followers and listeners, so please feel free to uh, get us on social media at Cameron Allen on Twitter. And we'll see you next time on the Cameron Journal Podcast.